Since the beginning, God of War has been a story focused on its lead character, Kratos. For most of the eight games, we see him cast in one role, that of a man fueled by rage and seeking retribution on the gods that manipulated his life. In God of War 2018, his story picks up from a new angle, cast into the role of mentor, husband, and father. By doing so, the player may notice a new thematic focus of this story. Instead of focusing on our main character, it is Atreus that we must zoom in on, to interpret the narrative through his eyes. When we do, we see that the characters of this game fit into the template of archetypal forces. Nearly all of them can be divided into three archetypes. Kratos, Thor, and Odin fall into the father archetype. Atreus, Baldur, Magni, and Modi all represent the child. Fey and Freya are expressions of the mother. This will be the first in a trilogy of God of War deep dives exploring each of these in depth. As I expect to see a greater characterization for Thor once Ragnarok comes around, we will save the father and child until later. For now, we will focus on the archetype of the Great Mother. When I speak of the Great Mother, I am not speaking of a positive and nurturing archetype. I am speaking of an Ouroboric mother which encompasses all possible expressions of it. Within the circle of this Ouroboric archetype lies positive traits, negative traits, and everything in between. They can be neglectful and neurotic, or nurturing and protective. For every Molly Weasley, we have a Queen Gertrude from Hamlet. For every Lady Jessica in Dune, we have Mother Gothel in the Rapunzel story. In these examples, we see that the Great Mother is divided into polarizing aspects. Dichotomy in literature is a tool used to compare and contrast two opposing things. Based upon the Latinized version of Greek, the root word dichotomia means to cut into two or divide into two classes. In the modern conceptualization of the archetype, all polarizing aspects are divided in two as we see with the previous examples. This is relevant to the story presented in God of War. The dichotomy between Fey and Freya could not be more different. The former doesn't appear in the game, but Fey's actions inform the player about her motivations and relationship to the child, Atreus. Freya, on the other hand, is a central figure in the narrative, and we see many more examples of how the Great Mother expresses itself through her. In order to fully understand the archetype, we will examine it in two ways, the Divided Goddess and the Unified One. Eric Neumann in his book The Great Mother and Analysis of the Archetype discusses the evolution of the conceptual mother through time. At one point, it was observed as one single figure that contained both positive and negative aspects. As mythology and philosophy evolved, this great mother was divided into smaller aspects. The Hindu goddess Kali is a good example of this archetype in its totality rather than a divided one like in other mythological systems. Instead of explaining it in my own words, I'll let the late Joseph Campbell speak on the matter. She's both a giver and a disciplinarian. Now in the Christian tradition, the, the goddess is split in two. You have the beneficent Madonna, but you also then have the hell hag, the, the witch, the negative. In the East, these two are put together. You see the wonderful goddess Kali. The word Kali means black time, that time out of which all things come and back into which it goes. She's in these two aspects. One is the giver and the other is the taker of life. So you see her right hand saying, don't be afraid. The other right hand with a bowl of rice giving you boons. This one with a sword in it and this one with a head that she has beheaded. This is the goddess, it's her totality. And uh, so she there represents the totality of the life dynamic. Considering Freya is a goddess of life, it seems fitting that she is both life-giving and protective, but also a Valkyrie capable of great violence when the need arises. Fey also has this duality, being a mother but also a great warrior. When observing these two in the literary sense, we observe these aspects of the Great Mother distilled down and channeled through them. Campbell goes on to explain how we all experience this archetype in our daily lives. Now, I was brought up a little Catholic, and we had images of the Virgin Mother, of the Madonna, all around, and I learned to experience my mother, my personal mother, as my local representative of the principle of motherhood represented in the image of the Virgin. 
It's a beautiful thing. Uh, you experience the, the, the loveliness of your own mother as a manifestation for you of the loveliness of a whole principle that's in the world, in the universe. In God of War, Freya and Faye should be interpreted as the same, the local representatives of this great mother archetype. However, some aspects are more prominent based upon their differing life experience and actions throughout the narrative. With all this in mind, we have a question to answer. Specifically, where do the two differ? Let's start with Freya. Her story is one of a mother who learned early on her son would die a needless death. In order to prevent this future, she made all things in the realm swear to never harm him. In a sense, she created a metaphysical bubble to keep him under her eternal protection. In simple terms, she is an overprotective mother. However, she takes it a step further. Freya never allows Baldur to leave this bubble. If we interpret this through the lens of the hero's journey, by being under her protection, Baldur is in the ordinary world. Even when he attempts to leave the nest, the spell of Freya's forces him to remain. In a healthy relationship, the motherly figure provides protection and safety for the child with the understanding that it is only temporary. One of the most difficult trials for the mother is to let the child go. Upon birth, the child is solely dependent on her for everything. Once they learn to walk, a degree of independence is attained. Upon reaching the threshold of adulthood, the mother must fight an internal battle to confront and defeat the devouring aspect. Otherwise, they risk infantilizing their adult child as we see with Freya and her son, Baldur. By clinging too tightly, she keeps him emotionally in the cradle, safe, but unable to really experience the world. Before proceeding, it is important to understand archetypes can express themselves through anyone. The great mother archetype doesn't only show up through a child's mother. It can do so through the father or a sister, an employer or a professor, even governmental systems. Anytime an individual or entity wraps another in a blanket of their protection and refuses to let them go, the devouring aspect of the great mother is at play. There's a reason the term mothering is a verb and can apply to anyone. King Triton in The Little Mermaid creates a bubble around his daughter, impeding Ariel's desire to experience a world outside the one from her childhood. Another example is Lord Elrond from The Lord of the Rings. With his foresight, he sees the future his daughter Arwen will experience if she leaves the protection of her people. For most of the story, he struggles with his instinct to spare her the pain and suffering that will come if she leaves his circle of protection. Freya's characterization in God of War is the internal struggle. Does she have the strength to confront her own devouring aspect? Can she allow her son to live on his own without the protection she placed upon him? While it may not be apparent at the start of the game, she has already begun resonating with this devouring archetype rather than fighting it. Let's look at her backstory and see what exacerbated this instinct. After centuries of war between the Aesir and the Vanir tribes, a truce was proposed. The ceasefire involved the marriage of Freya and Odin, a Vanir goddess and an Aesir god. After dealing with his paranoia, she eventually broke the marriage to get away from him. Odin's wrath cursed her, banishing her to Midgard with no way of leaving. Unable to return to her home, she is despised by her people for breaking the peace. From her perspective, the only good thing she had was her son, Baldur, who now hates her with a burning passion. After all, it is common for devouring mothers to incur the resentment of their children. No matter what, what I do or say, he won't... He won't stop interfering in my life! I was just trying to protect you! Despite this, she cherishes him deeply. Odin's actions ripped away every good thing in her life. The only thing that remains is her need to protect her little boy. If we argue that Odin's spite left a void in her soul, then her desire to fill that hole is the devouring nature of the Great Mother. Freya isolated herself in the woods and began to engage directly with a negative representation of this archetype. While it may not seem so at first, there are examples of this in the story. The first time we see her, she is distraught that a mystical boar is injured. Her home is a giant turtle that she protects, and in turn, it shelters her. In a sense, she has adopted both of these creatures to fill the hole where her son once was. 
As soon as she meets Atreus, she does the same, becoming a nurturing mother figure now that his true mother is deceased. During this first meeting, we see her wipe a smudge of dirt off his cheek. When the boy falls ill, she rejects Kratos at the door, but upon learning who is in need of help, she immediately opens up to take care of him. While in and of itself there is nothing wrong with caring for others, this devouring aspect can get out of control and lead to a toxic relationship. These involve impeding the child's ability to properly develop, keeping them eternally in her metaphorical arms. In mythology, these complexes are sometimes visualized as beasts to be slain. For this situation, the best example is probably the Lamia from Greek mythology. The origins of this half-serpent, half-human figure mirrors Freya's story. Before she was a monster, Lamia was a Libyan queen loved by Zeus. After the affair, Hera's jealousy led her to steal the queen's children. In some versions, she kidnapped them. In some, Hera killed them. In others, she forced the queen to kill them herself. This was not enough for Hera, who also cursed her to never sleep, to eternally mourn the loss of her children, not even given the momentary respite in dream. In order to sleep, Lamia attempted to cut out her own eyes in a fit of madness. The once beloved queen with children lost them, became an isolated hermit, and is shamed by her own people. Sound familiar? Zeus further cursed her into the form of a half-serpent and sent her off to devour the children of others. This is when she takes the form of a demonic devouring mother. The pain of loss is so unbearable that she looks to find the children of others to fill the void left by her own. In the myth, Lamia literally eats them to satisfy this craving, hence the term devouring mother. More conventional examples involve the individual searching for people or things to adopt, to replace what they feel is missing with someone else and showering them with love and protection to form a codependent relationship with those this archetype cares for. Even as far back as Freya's first meeting with Atreus, this devouring aspect of the Great Mother leads her to emotionally adopt him. Not because Atreus needs her, but because she needs him. During this scene, she openly admits to this. Did I tell you that I have a son too? It's been forever since I last saw him. At his birth, the runes foretold a needless death. The babe in my arms was so small, so helpless. I knew right then I would do anything to protect him, no matter the sacrifice. Of course, everything I did, I did for myself. I let my needs, my fears, come before what he needed, and I couldn't see his resentment until it was too late. Don't make the same mistake. Have faith in him. I know the truth isn't simple, but nothing is when it involves your child. Despite her warning to Kratos, she is unable to take her own advice. Freya does not have faith in her own son to survive on his own. Ironically, it is her overprotectiveness that leads to his death. Baldur's entire motivation throughout the story is to remove this protective spell his mother cast over him, in essence to finally be allowed out of the mother's embrace and into the world. Freya actively refuses. The negative aspect of the Great Mother archetype usurps her conscious personality, so much so that she would rather be killed by her son than to let go. She has become the Lamia. From Baldur's perspective, he, as the hero, must slay her to be free. I said earlier that an internal battle must be fought by the parent, to confront and slay this devouring instinct. Failing to do so generally causes two side effects. It creates an emotionally stunted child who also harbors resentment to the mother. Having failed in this fight, her son became collateral. Fear of the prophecy is what caused her to cling so tightly and her actions are what caused it to become true. The ruins were right, Baldur really did suffer a needless death. With Freya, we see an example of a mother who is unable to control this negative aspect of the archetype. Let's leave her behind now and move on to Faye. Unlike her counterpart, the devouring aspect does not control her. 
she slays it right at the beginning of the game. Faye was a frost giant known to her people as Laufey the Just. Much like Freya, she had visions of her son's future due to her gift of precognition. In order to protect Atreus, she erected a protective ward around the woods to both keep him safe and keep the family hidden from the eyes of the Aesir. This acts as a metaphysical mother's protection for his formative years. Unlike Freya, however, Faye understands this protection will not last forever. Rather than keeping her son trapped inside, her final act before death is to both remove this protection and force her son out into the world. The magical barrier around the woods was in place due to certain trees. Before her death, she marked them and instructed Kratos to cut them down for her funeral pyre. In addition, she requested that they take her ashes to the highest peak in all the realms. These two simple things was all it took for her to slay any devouring aspect she may have. With her death, the trees were cut down and the barrier was destroyed. With the death of the mother, her protection is ripped away. By tasking them to transport her ashes, she ensures that Atreus goes out into the world and begins working to leave his childhood behind. Faye could have chosen other trees or requested a burial instead. If she did, her son would have remained safe forever, never leaving the cabin of his birth. The gods would have remained oblivious, and Atreus would have lived a life without strife. But that is what Freya would have done. Faye knows that the hardest battle for a parent is to allow her child to leave this protection and venture out into the dangers of the wild. With her final breath, she wins this internal battle. While Freya and Faye are both nurturing and protective mothers, they are polar opposites. One is able to overcome the archetype of the devouring mother, the other is overtaken by it. By interpreting the story through the eyes of Atreus, he says goodbye to his childhood, while lighting the candles over his mother's body. But with this aura of protection gone, the danger of the world seeps in. As soon as he turns around, he sees the ominous figure of his father overlooking him a symbol of the dangers that await. With safety gone, he must head out and brave these dangers, to leave his childhood home, because his mother had the strength to let him go. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, please drop a like and subscribe to receive updates on future uploads. If you would like to help support the channel, a Patreon has been set up and the link is in the description below. Have a great day and peace be with you all.